I'm Helen Molesworth and I'm a gemologist, gem specialist and jewellery historian. And as part of our series of Encountering Beauty for Masterpiece, I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about one of the most abundant and widely distributed minerals in the world, quartz. It's the most commonly crystallised mineral, and no surprise, given that oxygen and silicon, which are the two elements which make up quartz, together make up almost 75% of the Earth's crust. Thanks to its abundance, quartz has made its way into decorative objects across cultures, across the world, for millennia. It's one of the earliest precious materials in use, and because of its variety of colours, it appears in many different forms. Not only purple amethyst, well known as the spiky natural crystals in geodes, but yellow citrine, coloured rock crystal, and even reds, oranges, green and blues. It was also due to such availability and variety that different quartzes became extremely strong features of mid-20th century jewellery, fitting the bold and sculptural designs of the late 30s and 40s, carvable gems created en masse, and also as replacements for the more elusively accessible gems, Colombian emeralds, Burmese rubies and Asian sapphires, whose production, export and trade had been curtailed like much else due to global politics and war. One of my absolute favourite jewels of all time is indeed one of these massive monsters of interwar production, but something so fabulous, so warm and so striking that it's a challenge to put it into words, and that is the suite of blue chalcedony, the translucent to opaque variety of blue quartz, made for the Duchess of Windsor by Suzanne Belperon in the mid-1930s. It was one of the most important jewels of the century and part of the fabulous collection so famously given to the Duchess by the Duke of Windsor, her husband and the former King Edward VIII. The Duchess was of course the American socialite and divorcee Wallace Simpson and to many the cause of the constitutional crisis created when King Edward VIII chose her over the British throne in 1936. Her collection contained emeralds, sapphires and rubies, but this is perhaps the most extraordinary of all. Instead of primary colours and bright, brilliant, transparent gems, the rounded carved beads of pale greyish blue, almost opaque and one might say purely decorative material, are far more soft, delicate, subtle and elegant than what at the time would have been termed precious gems. Sapphires and diamonds do feature as tiny accents, but it's the blue chalcedony which entirely steals the show. Its size and shape make it such a powerful jewel. The benefit of the chalcedony branch of the quartz family is that it is hard and tough enough to take carving and wearing well, seen in these huge floral and crown shaped motifs. I have been fortunate enough to try them on, and there is a physical feeling of the contrast of femininity and power in their form. And given that the Duchess herself was beyond slim, she fa once famously said, you can never be too rich or too thin, her wearing of such massive jewels was a bit of a statement. And in fact, the double cuff bracelets were called couron, crown or tiara cuffs, which seems a bit of an ironic reference to royalty that makes one wonder how much symbolism was built into this demi parure for the royal couple. It would have been commissioned around 1935, so exactly around the time of the Duke's abdication. The set combines the superb style of the Duchess of Windsor with the fierce vision of another extraordinary woman, Suzanne Belperon. Belperon was one of the most important jewellery designers in the 20th century, with clients including Josephine Baker, Fred Astaire, Elsa Schiaparelli and Christian Dior in addition to the Windsors. And it was during the 1930s that her style really came into its own, in which she showcased her particular love of sculptural hardstones, especially quartzes, with gem set accents. Her jewels were created out of many different quartzes, including transparent colourless rock crystal, rich purple amethyst, and of course our beloved blue chalcedony, celebrating the natural beauty of a previously overlooked material in haute joaillerie. She once explained why she would not sign her jewels like other famous jewellery houses, saying, my style is my signature, and here we can see exactly what she meant. For me, these jewels are just perfection, taking nature, and in this case not the rarest, but the most ideal material for the intended aesthetic, and transforming it into something absolutely unparalleled and unique, and fit for almost a queen.